So welcome back. Um, I have the extremely delightful honor of introducing Will Hall. Many of you know him. There's a there's a bunch written about him in here, so you can read all of that. So I don't have to read it to you. But I guess what I want to say is that um, I love you, Will. Aww. Will's definitely one of my favorite people on the planet. And um, I, I think it's fair to say that Will may be one of the, if not the um, foremost expert on holding space, being with people in extreme states, helping them get off psychiatric medicine, and just um, generally being an authentic and real and brilliant and entertaining good drummer human being. <laughs> and I think you're going to really enjoy this, and I'm so grateful you're here. Thank you. Um, I'm just really scared. I mean, I know I like... Um, yeah. Uh, I didn't think I was, in my notes I'm supposed to cry later, not right now, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, um, but uh, I do a lot of hiding, and uh, my original plan was to hide for this talk, but then I realized that not only was shame in the title of the talk, but authenticity is the theme of the conference, so I'm kind of like, it's like checkmate on my hiding game, you know, and um, thank you, Nita, thank you for that introduction, and um, so, uh, yeah, I get, I, I've, been, I've been really scared giving this talk, I've been really scared about um, showing up and being seen here, and and I, I understand that there's this big confusion because I have like a large presence, expressive. You wouldn't imagine that I'm, but that's part of the fear is how do I manage that um, inconsistency? And I, I uh, so I was, I was uh, with Dina, we were gonna go walk to the um, pools. And so we went in, into her, room to get something and I just I just started weeping. I just started weeping and I was crying and I just said, I'm I'm so scared. I'm and uh Dina looked at me and she says, Will, I can't support you. I can't be here for you. It's too much for me. And then I felt so much better. <laughs> um so I um I guess I learned that that this is uh just part of what happens with me is I you know I kind of struggle with the shame or the fear and then it somehow it's like not putting it in the driver's seat and not uh I don't know not I mean thank you for not giving me any support I guess is what I'm <laughs> saying in that moment because supporting it might have been the thing that wasn't so um i uh uh you know i'm thinking about as i'm thinking about how scared i am and what i want to talk about i'm thinking about what scott said yesterday was um that how the maybe for lang one of his dilemmas was that the recognition of desire the recognition of his desire, his recognition of his own desire, started to get confused with the desire for recognition. And I discovered something very um, deadly, which is that it's when you start to get recognized for having a talent, it it's, can be possible to start faking that talent. And so I very much don't want to... Um, uh, do that with you. And so I, I wrote a, I did a presentation at the salon. I did a um, talk and then I created a, a, a title for this talk that's in the program. And I think I said on the first night that I might 
change it, but then I was thinking that I need to be consistent. And I think, was it Emerson that said consistency is the hobgoblin of inferior minds or something, or small minds? And it's sort of like, it's true, but there's a way in which I have to be consistent. I need to, I have to be, I have to perform Will Hall. I have to be Will Hall in this consistent way. It's part of the, and it's sort of like I'm a product. Like I'm a brand, like there's a Will Hall brand. And so you're, you're wanting the Will Hall brand. And so, but then I could think, well, I could be the Will Hall brand that shows up inconsistently and authentically. And, but then that's like the Will Hall brand too. It's like the anti-brand. I'm like the anti-brand of Will Hall. So it's sort of this crazy trap and it destroyed um, or really harmed Lang. And it's something that I struggle with. And so I was really thinking about, you know, how do I, how do I not be on the conveyor belt of, of a presentation? And how do I not be a product? How do I not be a, um, a machine, you know, and, and be this consistent presentation? And, and so I really started to think about, well, what is it that I really want to, what is it that really moves me? What is it that really brings me? And what is it I've been, and I think people are interested in like how I work with people in, in what we call extreme states, what we call madness and that's part of it that's part of what i can say because when the shame is there and so many of the people that i work with um have just crippling shame like they there's shame about being seen there's shame about being in the world there's shame about doing anything in the world there's shame that that what they did in the past led to violence so they can't do anything at all other than hide and there's shame about not fitting in. Why can't they just, why can't they just? And there's all these different ways that you can work with someone else's shame and help them. But that's not what it is. What it is, is it's about my shame. And it's about the, the way in which when there's shame present, I'm called to work on my shame. So my shame is very, is very um, present and that's what I kind of want to focus on. And um, I think that's probably the big, it's been touched on quite a bit in the talks that the, the person that you're sitting with, the person that you're attending or witnessing or being with, it really needs to be a mutual experience or the seeds of violence are there. And I think Lang said that the denial of mutuality is the, the worst kind of violence. And if we're going to understand him. I think we have to get to the heart of that. And so I want to, Lang has been a really strong influence in who I am and what I bring to this um, since I was a teenager. And so I, I want to bring his spirit and his legacy, which I know through writing. I know through the writing. I was one of the people who kind of discovered his writing and was very found recognition and found mirroring and found a reflection and found like some some clarity through his writing and so the the shame of what is it the shame of not fitting in or not feeling like I can just breeze in and do a talk and I can't be I can't show up I can't I, I, I can't sit with people I can't uh, just have an ordinary conversation. People, people say, Will, how are you doing here at Esalen? And, and the first thing I want to say is, fuck you. you know, like We're at this authenticity thing and you're, you're asking me how I'm doing. And then I think that's not fair. That person's just trying to make a connection. And then I get really confused. And I think, well, I already ruined this interaction because I don't know how to <laughs> respond to what they're saying. And then I can't make eye contact because I'm trying to figure out what they meant. And now they've already gone and talked to somebody else. And then I'm you know, back by myself. And, and that shame of not being able to, like the failure of, of fitting in is so much about what we're talking about. And um, I had an experience before I went into the hospital that later I found mirrored in Lang. And I'll first tell you the mirror in his writing and then I'll tell you my experience. So the mirror was that in his book, Witness, in his book, Wisdom, Madness, and folly, wisdom, folly, and madness. Wisdom, no, madness. Right. Wisdom, ma thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Wis uh, he talks about an experience in his medical school days that kind of shocked him into a realization 
of that maybe the normal people are actually the mad ones and adapting to the society is maybe not the norm uh, that we want to as as uh, aspire to. And that was where he was in medical school, he was in a lecture and they were watching a film and the film was talking about the um, human physiology and the digestive system and um, something and there was this film of people's digestive tracts and you could see, it was an x-ray film, you could see people chewing and eating and the food would go through them. And then Lang thought about this for a moment, this is what he says in his biography, his autobiography, and then he raised his hands, how, how is it that you could make such a film because surely the prolonged exposure to x-ray is going to kill the person that you're photographing. And so the lecturer said, well these are, these are films from one of the death camps from World War II. These are films of, of prisoners that the Nazis killed and part of their medical experimentation was to take x-ray footage of them. And then the lecture just went on with the lecture. And there was something in for Lang, and this has always struck me, about how the disconnect between how he experienced the horror of everyone just kind of going on with this and his own sense of this is not right, this is something is really mad here. And so years um, before I read that in with Wisdom, Madness, Folly, I was spiraling down in my apartment in San Francisco and I was I had a very strong, aggressive voice telling me that I was a failure and I should kill myself. I, I was hiding from my roommates and I would, I would, um, I, I, I would get these phone calls and no one was on the, on the other line of the phone call and I was terrified that there was some demon that was coming after me. And I, I remember I was working, I was very involved in the environmental movement at this time and I was working on a, an essay and Life magazine had just, I was writing a, an essay about the environmental movement and the environmental crisis. And there was a, an issue of Life magazine. Life was the old photography magazine. And it had a picture of Mars, the planet Mars on the cover. And the title was Mars, Our Next Home. And I remember staring at this, and I remember feeling what I imagine Lang must have felt years later, that there's something just horrifying that's out of reach of what is normal. And that focusing on that and trying to understand that and not understanding it and not making sense of it, that was the moment at which I... I my spiral just got more and more out of control and I ended up in the psychiatric system. And so um, that's what I want to talk about. I think that we've talked about Lang as the, um, as the uh, um, presenter of a more humane way of being with people in madness. And we've talked about Lang as the, the presenter of a more authentic and humane way of us being human. But there's also a very important piece of this that we haven't talked about yet. And this is something that torments me. This is something that I'm really actively struggling with. And I, I think it's a big part of why I don't, I don't feel like I just need to find unconditional love or just kind of feel stronger to be here. I feel like my, my shame is, is right. I feel like there's a reason that I have that I'm ashamed. And there's a reason that I don't feel like I don't know if this is what I want to do or this is where I want to be or if this is where I'm allowed to be or if this is where it's safe to be. So that's what I want to talk about. And um, But first, I want to make an advertisement for the treasure hunt that's going to happen. This is our annual R.D. Lang Memorial treasure hunt. And there are two prizes this year. We have two prizes. The first prize is a, a very nice mass market paperback edition of Politics of Experience, R.D. Lang's Politics of Experience. And as it is our tradition, we always get a copy that's signed. So it's a signed copy, it's signed by me. And um, 
That's the, uh, that's the tradition. And it's, uh, it's somewhere in, well, I'm okay. We're going to just remind me. And then the second, the second prize is also a book, but it's a, uh, it's a surprise book. And the condition, if you win the treasure hunt, if you find one or perhaps both of these books, the condition is you, you must start reading them within like a month or so, or six weeks or so. And if you don't, just give them to somebody on the condition. Is that, un- is that like, un- is that poison the treasure hunt? Nope. You're making a face. Every, okay, Marion doesn't have to do the treasure, treasure hunt if you don't want to. But, but um, yeah. But you have to read the whole thing. And a report. Uh, no, no report. Okay, so. Um, so now we know we found the second book if you, you don't know what it is. You'll know. You'll know. Trust me, you'll know. So, um, so we've, I think we've rightly, I don't, I don't, do you say Sartre? Do you say Sartre? Do you say French? I'll just say Sartre for, for pronunciation. That's, yeah, that works? Okay. Sartre. Okay. Doug says it's okay, so I know I'm in good, good ground. Okay. So um, Sartre was asked, because I think we're, it's right to locate Lang in, in that tradition and that question of authenticity that Sartre brought forward. Sartre was asked as he was older, um, about his own legacy. And Sartre said, if a certain Sartre is to be remembered, remember the historical situation in which I lived. And there, I, I don't, I'm not an existential philosopher or Sartre scholar, but my understanding is that to really understand uh, Sartre and authenticity, one of the things that's been helpful for me to understand is how much he used World War II and being part of the French resistance, being an underground secret stealth spy fighter against the Nazi occupation of of France, and that this gave him a sense of enlivenment, a sense of vitality, a sense of authenticity that was kind of paradigmatic for him in his in his life. And then, as he um, after the war. He was very much grounded in the revolutionary tradition. He was very strongly influenced by Marxism. Later in his life, he, he considered himself an anarchist, but he was very much a revolutionary anti-capitalist in the broad sense. He would critique Russia and Stalinism, and he would critique the, the communisms of his day, but from within the revolutionary tradition, not as a defender of bourgeois society or capitalist society. And so I think this is very important. He was also in the he was also writing in the context of the anti-colonial struggles. There was the the revolution in Algeria in 1959 and there were in the 50s and 60s there were all these revolutionary anti-colonial struggles. He went to Cuba in 59. And he went to Cuba in 1959 and um, and uh, so this was also I think very important for us to understand Lang's context. Because Lang is, is writing in a period where the possibility of revolution in the, in the United States and the UK was not some crazy fantasy. I mean, there was very real um, uprising that was happening. And there was, there's a way in which the question of authenticity is very specifically situated in that hist- historical context for Lang and also for Sartre. So in general, when we're talking about the crisis over there, in Lang's context, it was the US war in Vietnam and especially the the nuclear arms race. When we talk when we talk about the crisis over there, Lang was I think part of his the power and so what's so compelling to me is that he's simultaneously talking about a, a problem of intimacy a problem of our relationship to ourselves that we can maybe in the overarching sense call the problem of of authenticity um, if it's located historically and in that context. And so, I mean, I'm going to read a number of quotes that I think point in the direction that, I'm, that I want to go. And, and he says that with regards to Vietnam, he says, let no one suppose that this madness, the U.S. war in Vietnam, exists only somewhere in the night sky where our birds of death hover in the stratosphere. This madness exists in the interstices of our most intimate and personal moments. It's the same madness. And that's what is so crucial about Lang's 
voice and Lang's vision. And um, he starts to talk about the broader crisis that we're facing in the sense of a possibility. And a lot of the radical writers, Dr. King wrote about this, and a lot of them write about a possibility. And I want to suggest that possibility has actually already arrived. And he says that uh, we, we all live under the constant threat of our own annihilation. I don't think he means symbolic annihilation. I think he means quite literal annihilation. I think he's referring to the nuclear threat at that time. Only by the most outrageous violation of ourselves have we achieved our capacity to live in relative adjustment to a civilization apparently driven to its own destruction. It is quite certain that unless we resolve our behavior much more satisfactorily than at present, we are going to exterminate ourselves. And he says that human beings seem to have an almost unlimited capacity to deceive themselves and to deceive themselves into taking their own lies for truth. We are all in a post-hypnotic trance. I'm putting these together. We are all in a post-hypnotic trance induced in infancy. What is to be done? We who are still half alive, living in the often fibrillating heartland of senescent capitalism, can we do more than reflect the decay around and within us? Can we do more than sing our sad and bitter songs of disillusionment and defeat? That's a challenge to authenticity and um, You know, I, I did some research. I tried to, I tried to really make a moment in this talk where I could summarize or evoke what the world historic situation is, and I can't. I don't. There's not even a name for it. I mean, when you talk about the climate crisis, there is so much that you're leaving out of it. When you talk about the ecological destruction, it sounds like something on the Nature Channel or David Attenborough is telling us about. Well, I don't even, I don't, I don't think we have a word for this. We don't actually have a term. There are people that are talking, uh, Extinction Rebellion is talking about extinction now. And um, I started to think about, well, how could we frame it in a way that actually makes it reachable to our authenticity? How, do, how could we frame it in a way that breaks through a hypnotic trance? We're in a hypnotic trance of acting like this isn't happening. And I thought about a war on our children. There's a war on our children happening right now. I mean, I don't know what language, but the, the actual, I mean, I started to make a list. I mean, climate change just sounds like beverage preference or something. Right. Climate change is this, I mean, deforestation. More than half of all the original pre-agricultural human trees are left. The sea level rise, overpopulation, species loss, habitat loss, water scarcity, soil depletion, pollution, one-seventh of all deaths are the results of pollution, fishing collapse, ocean acidification, the possibility of the collapse of the basis of the global food chain because of the destruction of the, I mean, it's, I mean, it becomes abstract, right? It's like we, this is the trance that comes and I can't, I can't feed statistics. I can't start to evoke this. The dead zones in the ocean, the, the pollinator collapse, the possibility of the world food supply collapse, extreme weather, weather sea levels rising. And then we talk about the, the, there's a way in which the complexity of our civil, global civilization creates a vulnerability. So now things like nukes going off, nuclear war or, or a solar flare destroying the electrical grid or an asteroid impact or the possibility that technology, there are possibilities that technology, like when the atom bomb was first detonated at um, the Trinity site, there was, a, there was a real risk that some scientists were saying that this could ignite the atmosphere 
and destroy the planet. But there was a rush to build the weapons and so some technology accident, the nanotechnology, the pan- pandemic, something could happen with biotechnology. And it's interesting if you look at the what the elites are saying, what the one percent, what the the wealthy and their consultants are saying, they're talking about an extermination event that's coming. They're talking about an event that's coming. They're talking about some kind of, and the, and the scientists are modeling the possibility of runaway. I don't know how to talk about this. I don't know how to talk about this. I, I really don't. I, I, I don't. And um, so, but I feel like that's that's what I want. That's what I want to talk about. That's what I feel like we need to talk about. Um, Because I think that I, it, I think that really is what Lang is challenging us around. I think that really is what he's challenging us around to somehow make the connection between the thing that's out there that's maybe coming and something that we're doing to ourselves and doing to each other in this post-hypnotic trance. And um, so I I developed I, I I came up with this exercise before we open because I want to open this up to discussion and. Um, and the exercise is to think of a moment, and I want to encourage you to, I'll do it with you, but I want to encourage you to do this, is think a moment of a moment in your life, and it could be, a, it could be one instance or it could be a period of time, where um, you, because of your choices, you really failed as a human. You really failed to be a human. You failed to be authentic or you failed to, the, some human responsibility that you fail, that you know you did, you know you failed. And for some of us, it's an act of violence that may, we maybe did, or an act of, of emotional violence, or an act of neglect. Or um, I think about um, I think about my dad, who just died recently, and I think about I mean I get people rush to say it's okay, it's not your fault, you did as much as you could, and you were a good son, and all this kind of shit. But if I'm honest with myself, I know that I, there was ways that I failed my father. I failed to just be a simple, I just failed to, I failed to have the courage, I failed to have the courage to approach him and to have more of a relationship with him, you know? And I was in a, I was in a trance, you know, I was in a trance, you could say. I was in a habit. I was in a... So I know people want to, like, support me, and they want to, you know, but I don't need support. I need to face something about how I failed. I failed my father. You know, I failed to be a human being. I failed to be authentic. I failed to have some kind of courage, you know. And I know, I know that's a truth that I live with. And um, so I want to encourage you all to think about a moment when you failed. And you know you, know you failed. You, you just weren't human. You know, it wasn't, you could have, you could have, but you didn't. And, and think about that moment. And now, maybe you have that moment. I want you to really think about what it is that's behind all these words global food system collapse, overpopulation, climate change. What, what is that something is, there's something behind this. It's this very huge, very huge thing that, and I, I, I want to be bold. I want to say none of us are truly responding to, or maybe you are, you know you're not responding to in some way. So think about that and think about how you are also failing with that and think about how lang wants us to connect those two things lang wants us to see that an intimate failure to be mutual intimate failure to be authentic or in, like my relationship with my dad in some ways something intimate 
is connected with this larger historical social context that we're in. So think about how that connects and turn to someone next to you and talk about it a little bit. For a few minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.